rising tension. New developments in the situation between Russia and Ukraine. How the White House is responding. Fight for the unborn. A pro-life lawmaker tells us why he is concerned about the Biden administration's pro-abortion policies. Word of God. The Holy Father has advice for the faithful for what to do if we have a little downtime. And path to sainthood. Two priests and two lay people are honored in El Salvador. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, January 24th, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this feast of St. Francis de Sales. I'm Tracy Sable. So will there be a war tonight? President Joe Biden is considering his options to respond to a possible Russian invasion of Ukraine. And Pope Francis wants the world to ask God for help. White House correspondent Owen Jensen begins our coverage tonight. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. The Pentagon has proposed a range of options for President Joe Biden. And come this Wednesday, Pope Francis, the leader of the world's Catholics, is asking for prayers to keep war from breaking out. As President Joe Biden arrived back at the White House this morning, there was no easing of tensions between Russia and the West over Ukraine. Pope Francis tweeting his fears over possible war while urging Wednesday, 26 January, be a day of prayer for peace. And in the White House press briefing room today, okay. concerns mounting over what happens next. And we have a sacred obligation to support the security of our eastern flank countries. I think it's important to remember who the aggressor is here. It is not the United States. It is not these eastern flank countries. Uh, it is Russia. Just this past weekend, the White House releasing this photo, President Biden meeting with his national security team at Camp David. One option being floated, the president could reinforce U.S. military presence in Eastern Europe and the Baltics to demonstrate American commitment. The United States did just ship another load of lethal weapons and ammunition to Ukraine to help the country ward off another possible invasion from Russia. If a single additional Russian force goes into Ukraine, uh, in an aggressive way, uh, as I said, that would trigger uh, a swift, a severe, and a united response uh, from us uh, and from Europe. And NATO is bolstering its deterrence in the Baltic Sea region, including sending fighter jets and ships. And when it comes to imposing sanctions, both Lithuania and Denmark weighed in on that. We need to really uh, be true to our words when we say that the sanctions will be unbearable. They have to be unbearable, and that's the only uh, uh, deterrent. There's no doubt we are ready to react forcefully with comprehensive uh, sanctions never seen before. A senior U.S. official says the State Department has authorized the departure of some U.S. government employees and ordered the departure of all family members of U.S. government employees at the U.S. Embassy in Kyiv. And we're learning tonight the Pentagon says up to 8,500 U.S. troops are on heightened alert. So they'll be prepared to deploy if needed. No decision has yet been made. Also today, the White House says President Biden held a secure video call with European leaders and allies. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. And joining me now to discuss is Michael Baker, former CIA covert operations officer and CEO of the global intelligence firm Portman Square Group. Michael, great to see you. Great to see, have you back on. As we just heard from Owen, the U.S. has shipped military equipment to Ukraine. In addition, troops were placed on high alert today. Mike, how do you think this is going to play out? And do you think these actions, as well as those of our NATO allies, do you think that will be enough of a deterrence? Well, I, I think they're important to take these steps, but I don't think, in a sense, that they're going to be the deterrent that stops Putin, because I, I, I still, at this point, don't believe that Putin's endgame here is a full-on invasion. And so, in, in a sense, again, uh, what we're doing now is important and essential, these various steps that we're now taking. I would argue that we're taking some of them a little bit later than we should have. Uh, but... Ultimately, you have to ask yourself, what is what is Putin's game here? Why is he doing this? And I, I again, I believe that what he's looking for it, it are some victories. He knows that he's not going to get everything he's asked for, particularly this idea that, you know, somehow we will put in writing that, that Ukraine will never be allowed to enter NATO. I don't think that's going to happen anyway, but we're not going to put that in writing. So I think there's certain things that he's looking for out of this. 
uh, and it will stop short of a large-scale military conflict. You know, another thing I want to talk about is um, yesterday, you probably heard the Biden administration ordered a departure for family members of staff at the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine and then a voluntary departure for government employees. However, they told American citizens in the country to, to leave on their own since the U.S. government will not be in a position to evacuate them. I want to get your thoughts on that. And what do you think that signals, in particular, to those Americans in Ukraine? Well, I think, it, first of all, it signals an awareness from the Biden administration that the, uh, the debacle, uh, the, 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 the problem that we had with Afghanistan is still looming in people's minds. And the last thing that they want is to see sort of a, a, a 2.0 of that. Um, so, look, uh, as you pointed out, the U.S. has, has instructed uh, dependents to leave, uh, as has the U.K., uh, now Australia and Germany have joined in that. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's prudent. It's the right step. And typically, you always see this when hostilities or the potential for hostilities rise really anywhere in the world. The U.S. Embassy always says uh, the first thing they do is they, is they move out the dependents, the families. Uh, so that's a, that's a, a good uh, step. But I, you know, again, I think the key here is to, is to look at this from Putin's perspective. And right now, he is able to afford this adventurism uh, in part because the current U.S. administration has allowed, uh, in a sense, oil to rise up to, you know, record levels for the past seven or eight years, $85 a barrel. You know, in the past, when, when oil was down to $30 a barrel or below, Putin couldn't afford to engage in this sort of activity. It just wasn't going to be possible. But, you know, so that's, that's an element of this as well. We, sh we should be thinking about this holistically rather than just, okay, you know, this is a, a, something that we address on one track only. Yeah. Uh, so much going on around the world, as you know. I want to talk about China now. Uh, Taiwan is reporting that 39 Chinese aircrafts entered its air defense zone this weekend. And today, the Department of Defense said that two U.S. aircraft carrier groups entered the South China Sea for training. What do you think this indicates? And why do you think China is taking these actions right now? Right. Well, this is an extension of what they've been doing for uh, a couple of years. This is the largest incursion by the Chinese Air Force into uh, what's known as sort of the island's defense zone um, since uh, the last quarter of, of 2021, since October. Uh, so I, I think, again, under the theory that nothing happens in a bubble, the world is, is always shrinking, right, in a sense. Uh, what's happening in Russia and, and with Ukraine and, and the U.S. reaction uh, is being watched by President Xi. Now, look, the, the, the Xi regime has been very clear, as China has been for decades, over how they view Taiwan, which is Taiwan belongs to us. And so, you know, could it be that President Xi is thinking about maybe accelerating the time frame at the point where they want to absorb Taiwan? I, I don't believe it would be, again, through, you know, what we consider traditional military uh, intervention. But the idea that perhaps they accelerate that time frame because they're looking around and they're thinking, we don't honestly think we're going to get any serious pushback here. Yeah, for sure. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if you saw this or not, but Representative Michael McCall from Texas said that he thinks that China will invade Taiwan after the Olympics. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on that. Do you think that's a possibility? Well, you never rule out anything uh, when we're talking about, you know, something uh, as serious as this. But, uh, I think it's that's probably a little bit too simplistic in, in terms of viewing uh, what the Chinese regime military would think about uh, here. Look, they 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 will at some point make a move. Again, I don't believe necessarily that it's going to be an old school uh, military uh, invasion. I think that there's you know the next major conflict is going to play out in a much different way. It's going to be in cyberspace. It's going to involve space. It, it's going to involve sort of a, uh, you know, reaching out and, and, uh, and, and, and disabling infrastructure within the target uh, country. So I don't think we can, we can actually, we, we have to kind of get outside of our old school thinking in terms of how these conflicts will play out in the future. Uh, and that means we have to think about what a, a proportional and appropriate response will be from our and our allies' perspective. Yeah, unfortunately, we have to leave it right there. So much more we can talk about. But, Mike, we appreciate you coming on and giving us your analysis. Of course. Thank you.
A Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI now says that he did attend a disputed meeting in Munich back in 1980. The 94-year-old previously said that he had not been present at the discussions regarding a German priest who had admitted to the sexual abuse of children. Pope Benedict blamed the error on an editing mistake, saying that it was not done in bad faith. He is accused of mishandling four cases of clergy abuse during his time in the Archdiocese of Munich and Freising. He denies the charges. Officials in France say those who are not vaccinated against COVID-19 are no longer allowed in bars, restaurants, gyms and sporting events. The unvaccinated who recently recovered from the coronavirus are exempt from the measure. The new law takes effect today. Previously, uh, part of the vaccine proof of vaccination or a recent negative test were required for admission to bars, restaurants and museums. Coming up, pro-life lawmaker Chris Smith tells us why he's concerned about the pro-abortion stance of President Biden. Plus, analysis of the 49th annual March for Life with Amber Athey of The Spectator. Well, tens of thousands of people attended the 49th annual March for Life in Washington late last week. They were there to speak out on the value of human life and the evil of abortion. And if Republicans take back the House and Senate in midterm elections later this year, they say that they will make pro-life issues a priority. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has more. Catholic Congressman Chris Smith spoke to thousands at the March for Life in the nation's capital last week, the day before the rally. The New Jersey Republican wrote an editorial for The Washington Times. He says President Biden's embrace of the pro-abortion agenda has caused him to speak out and should cause other people of faith to speak out as well. The idea behind this op-ed was to try in some small way to make people even more aware that Joe Biden, who used to be modestly pro-life, is now aggressively pro-abortion, so much so that he is the abortion president. In his op-ed, the Republican chair of the Congressional Pro-Life Caucus writes, quote, Today, a radically different, almost unrecognizable Mr. Biden has weaponized the entire federal bureaucracy to aggressively promote abortion on demand, at home and overseas. That view isn't shared by most Democrats, including the commander-in-chief. Catholic President Joe Biden said in a statement the day after the march, the Biden-Harris administration strongly supports efforts to codify Roe, and we will continue to work with Congress on the Women's Health Protection Act. Senator Patty Murray from Washington State, also a Catholic, says the U.S. Supreme Court's legalization of abortion in 1973 has improved women's lives. It prevented a lot of harm and helped keep many patients healthy it opened doors for women to pursue their career and education goals, and it affirmed the right to control our own bodies and our own futures. Roe was a giant leap forward. Killing a baby is not a human right. It's the antithesis of a human right. The human right is to live, uh, to be unmolested and unkilled uh, in the case of, a, of an abortion. And, and um, so this is the most fundamental of all human rights. Most Americans appear to agree on pro-life measures. A Knights of Columbus Marist poll released last week shows 71% of Americans support legal limits on abortion. Congressman Smith tells me that Republicans are anxious to take back the House in November, allowing them to solidify pro-life protections. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. And joining me now to discuss is Amber Athey, Washington editor at The Spectator. Amber, great to see you. Great to see you in person. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thank you. All right, we have a lot to get to. But first, I want to talk to you about that statement by President Biden, basically saying that he would like to codify Roe versus Wade. Your thought on that and our second Catholic president. Well, it's uh, clearly just rhetoric because Joe Biden's agenda um, across the board domestically is already dead in Congress. The idea that he would even be able to do this is so unrealistic. He could barely get the infrastructure bill passed by with a bipartisan Congress, and he wasn't able to get his massive spending bill passed as well, or his voting rights legislation. Um, so the idea that he would even be able to do this obviously is, is not going to happen. Uh, but it's really stunning to see that the White House repeatedly tells us how Joe Biden is a devout Catholic and they always flaunt the fact that he's going to mass every Sunday but he is against church teaching on such a huge issue the issue of life and so it does feel like a slap in the face to Catholics that their first Catholic president in so many years would take this stance on Roe v Wade 
Yeah, and to your point, something else. Uh, there's a group, and I know that you've heard about this, making so much, you know, uh, so much head not headway, I should say, to speak, but gaining attention on social media. This group um, called Catholics for Choice and what they did in the Basilica, kind of projecting those images. Talk to us about that. What your thoughts were when you saw that? Well, it was so inflammatory. It was obviously meant to enrage Catholics, not to actually change minds. And unfortunately, many members of this group, well, I, mean, I would argue that all of them are not Catholics, but some of them are not even, uh, they don't even identify as Catholic. So for example, their press secretary is a transgender Protestant. So the idea that they speak for some uh, un, un silent majority of Catholics is just ridiculous. And then to go and try to essentially desecrate one of our, um, you know, most sacred uh, buildings in the D.C. area to try to get their message across is, um, is really just sad and I think speaks to um, their tactics and, and how they don't really align with even not just the teaching of the church, but also the way that we are supposed to conduct ourselves when um, engaging politically. Absolutely, and especially on the eve of March for Life. So very disturbing. Um, a lot happening over the weekend. Um, also another rally that was held in D.C. This one was against uh, the COVID-19 mandates. There was a large crowd there. Also other cities around the world also held similar uh, protests. I want to get your thoughts on that and kind of what this is signaling. I think this is a signal that there are so many rational people out there who might be pro-vaccine but recognize that for many people the vaccines are not a necessity. We know at this point CDC Director Rochelle Walensky has confirmed it, that the vaccines don't stop you from catching the virus. They don't stop you from sp spreading the virus. The main benefit of getting a vaccine is to lower your risk of hospitalization and death. And if you're a young person, if you're a child, if you're someone without comorbidities, that should be a personal decision for you on whether or not you think that the risks of getting the vaccine are worth slightly reducing your chance of hospitalization, which is already very low to begin with. And so a lot of people are saying, what is the purpose of a mandate when this vaccine does not stop the spread? That would be the whole point for any other vaccine that people are required to get is that it stops you from spreading it to other people. And that is not the case here. And people are pointing out the illogic of these mandates. Yeah. Another thing I want to get to is President Biden. Uh, a new poll came out today by Rasmussen. It found that only 28 percent of Americans think that the nation is headed in the right direction. Uh, I want to get your analysis and thoughts on that. Yeah, it's really no surprise when in just a year of his first term in office, we've seen gas prices skyrocket. We've seen supply chain issues. We've seen the push to teach our children critical race theory, mask mandates in schools. Uh, he claimed that he was going to reopen schools and schools are still shut down in many parts of the country. And then you have his uh, law enforcement arm, the DOJ, going after parents for speaking out at school board meetings, likening them to domestic terrorists and now promising to continue to go after so-called anti-authority government threats um, at home. So. Across the board, Biden's first year has been a disaster. The people are aware of it. And whatever messaging is coming out from Jen Psaki to calm down and have a margarita and go to your kickboxing class is a further insult to people who know exactly what's going on and are worried that their uh, their families are going to be suffering the consequences of just a disastrous policy across the board that has led to economic uh, national security, and many other um, negative implications for families. Amber, not a whole lot of time left. But before I let you go, what else are you working on and what do you have your eye on? Right. So over the next week, we're going to be looking at the possibility, unfortunately, of a, another foreign entanglement with what's going on between Russia and Ukraine. And Joe Biden suggested during a press conference last week that if Russia did something that was only a slight intrusion on Ukraine, then he wouldn't respond. And that was opening the door for Russia to go ahead and call his bluff. And so we're definitely keeping an eye on what the implications are going to be there with our foreign policy and whether or not Americans are going to have to rebound from just getting troops withdrawn drawn from Afghanistan and then turning around and getting involved in another foreign conflict. And I think the appetite for that is very low among the American people. Well, Amber, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate your time and your analysis as always. Thanks. It was good to be here. Up next, the Holy Father's message for Word of God Sunday. We have a report from Rome. Plus, four people, including two priests, are one step closer to possible sainthood.
Pope Francis reminds the faithful that we can be inspired and transformed by reading every day from part of the gospel. Tante omilie sono astratti. At a Sunday address to pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy Father says the Word of God is alive and so effective that it will help with all of our concerns and anxiety. Pope Francis urged the faithful to carry a copy of the Gospels with them and to read when we are stuck in traffic, waiting in line, or have any downtime. Well, the Holy Father also gave an address for Word of God Sunday. Yesterday in it, he reminded us that God speaks to us and fills us with hope through passages in the Bible. È venuto per la liberazione dei poveri e degli oppressi. During Mass of the Vatican, Pope Francis said the Word of God nurtures and renews our faith, and he urged the faithful to put the Bible in the center of our spiritual life. The Sunday of the Word of God is the third Sunday in ordinary time. Joining us now from Rome is Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Andreas, great to see you. Uh, first of all, can you tell us more about the Mass and what the Holy Father said uh, for Word of God Sunday? Of course, Tracy. I was there actually yesterday with two of my boys. It was a beautiful ceremony which put the Word of God at its center. But because it is also marked, it also marked the introduction of new offices into the Church, it was not without controversy. But let me back up a bit. Uh, Pope Francis established a Sunday of the Word of God with an apostolic letter called Aperoid Illis, open to them, it's called, in 2019. The Holy Father highlighted how important it was to set aside moments to reflect on the great importance of the Word of God for everyday life. At the same time, Pope Francis said that the Church in different countries had undertaken a wealth of initiatives to make the sacred scripture more accessible to believers. They should strive daily to embody and bear witness to its teachings. And therefore, Pope Francis declared that the third Sunday in ordinary time was to be devoted to the celebration, study, and dissemination of the Word of God. Uh, and Andreas, we understand Pope Francis also took part in a ceremony yesterday. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. So, uh, Pope Francis conferred the ministry of lector, so the reader, to two men and six women, and the ministry of catechist to five men and three women. This rite is only approved at experimentum, meaning on an experimental basis. This is the first time that lay people have taken on the ministry of the lector or reader. The Holy Father gave each one the Bible as a sign of the Word of God that they will have to proclaim. It was also the first liturgy during which catechists have been instituted by Francis, and they received a replica of the pastoral cross used by St. Paul VI, then by St. John Paul II, to recall the missionary character of the service they are about to administer, a symbol of faith in Christ. This ministry is different, I should say, from ordained ones, which instead originate from a specific sacrament of holy orders. Well, uh, tomorrow, the Holy Father has an event regarding the Week of Christian Unity. What more can you tell us about that and also his Vesper service? Sure, Tracy. So, tomorrow, Pope Francis will close the worldwide celebration of the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity with an evening prayer at the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls, right on the solemnity of the conversion of St. Paul. The Week of Prayer for Christian Unity is being marked this year under the theme, We Saw the Star in the East and we came to worship Him. This week of prayer is held annually from January the 18th to the 25th, and it involves churches and Christian confessions across the globe. A very important week for the Church and for Christian unity across the world. Well, Andreas, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Andreas Townhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Thank you again. Thank you, Tracy. Well, finally tonight, two priests and two lay people in El Salvador are one step closer to sainthood. All four died during the country's civil war. One Jesuit priest, along with his friend and a teenager, were murdered in 1977. And a Franciscan priest was killed in 1980 at the altar of his parish church. At the service yesterday, crowds gathered around yellow and white Vatican banners and portraits of the four between 1977 and 1989. Death squads and soldiers in El Salvador killed 13 Catholic priests. 
And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. We leave you tonight with the sights and sounds from last Friday's March for Life in the nation's capital. Good night and God bless. In the world. Today is a beautiful day to come together from all walks of life, from every corner of our country, and really fight for the, those most vulnerable amongst us, the unborn. There is a joy in seeing so many people from all across the country and around the world coming together for this, but there's also that sadness because we know why we march. We march for life because every life is sacred. We march because every life is created in the image and likeness of God. Abortion. And what it's done is broken our hearts. Every child matters. Every woman matters. Every person matters. So many young people would take time out of their busy schedules, out of their lives.